Hi, welcome to the Michelson Interferometer Lab. Uh, I'll walk you through the pieces first and we'll talk about how we're going to use this thing to actually do an interesting experiment, which is to measure the index of refraction of air. So the first part of the setup is the helium neon laser. And I've left this on for a while for it to stabilize so that the wavelength of the light has, has come uh, it's come to stop moving. The, the size of this chamber has, has uh, come to thermal equilibrium with the surrounding air. That light gets focused with this microscope objective to a pretty small point, pretty nearby, uh, which then gets spread out to be about as big as this uh, set of mirrors here. Now, this first mirror is silvered, it's a half silvered mirror, which means that on one side there's a coating of reflective metal that's just enough so that half of the light gets reflected and half of the light gets transmitted. And let me point out that the coating is on the side of the mirror that's, that's away from me. It's on this side of the mirror. So what happens is the light goes through the glass of this mirror, hits the coating, then it splits into two directions. Half of it keeps going, goes through this piece of glass, which is called a compensator plate. It's the same thickness and same composition as the, uh, the mirror. It just has no coating. So the light just goes through there. It bounces off this mirror, which is fixed in terms of going back and forth, but it can be adjusted in terms of its tip and tilt angle here. And when that happens, uh, we can use this to align the interferometer. And that light comes back off this mirror, goes through the compensator plate again, and hits the surface of this mirror. And again, it splits. Half the light goes off to the screen here, and half the light goes through and to the laser, back to the laser, where, where we just ignore it. All right, so that's the one path, is, is from here back this way. The other path is to go through the, the glass here, hit the surface, go back through the glass again, hit this mirror, which I can't tip and tilt it, but I can move it back and forth with these adjustments here. Fine, fine adjustment and a coarse adjustment. So that sets the difference in path length. That light then bounces back through the glass a third time and again gets split. So half of it goes to the screen, half of it bounces off and goes to the laser and we ignore it. All right, so that's the operation of the interferometer. The things I can adjust are the path length difference. And there's a ruler here marked in centimeters. So it's actually backwards the way the ticks go as I make the path length of this one longer and longer and longer, the numbers go down. So keep that in mind when I report some numbers. The other two adjustments are the tip and tilt of this mirror which I'll show you in a second how that affects the fringes. And you can already actually see a little bit how that affects the fringes. I can center, center the fringes there. And uh, let me get the zoom in camera and I'll show you the fringes as I make some of these adjustments. So now I've got my camera set up here to look at the fringes on this uh, screen, this piece of paper. And I'll show you some of the adjustments I can make and what they do. So. This interferometer is just on the table, so I have to be a little bit careful not to push it too far. But right now you can see that the, the fringes are pretty stripy, and if I even just touch the table, you can see they sort of get blurry for a little bit. So I'm just tapping very gently on the table. If I tap very gently on the interferometer, the same thing happens. So I'll make adjustments and I'll let go, and I'll let everything settle. So why is it stripy? Well, it's stripy because this mirror whose angle I can adjust is not really properly tipped and tilted. So the stripes are mostly horizontal stripes, which means that the two waves are, are hitting each other um, tilted vertically. So what I need to do is I need to push mostly this top adjuster, which tips the mirror forward and backward. So let me do that. I'll, I'll move the adjuster. No, that's the wrong way, because the stripes got finer. Let me go the other way. All right, stripes are getting bigger, bigger, bigger in there, and now I can make them pretty vertical. And I can do the other adjustment, and 
and I'm tilting the mirror left and right. So I'm going to make the left and right stripes bigger and bigger and bigger. All right, so now they're pretty horizontal. So that means I still have some adjustment here in the vertical stripe. There we go. And now you can see, even when I talk, the fringe moves a little bit because this is all very sensitive. Um, and as it goes through bright and dark, what's happening is the path that the light is taking is changing by half of a wavelength. And so we're going from constructive to destructive interference. And I can adjust the, the path length here. And you can see that if I'm very careful, I can adjust to almost within a wavelength of light with the gearing that, that's here. Now the problem is every time I touch it, it jumps around a little bit. So it's a little bit hard to see. But let me just show you. I'm going to turn this, this knob. I'm going to slowly move the adjustable mirror, and you can see fringes go by. Boom, 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 boom. And I let go. Let me do the fine adjust here, engage it. Oops, see, I engaged it, and I already adjusted the tilt a little bit, so let me fix that. So the path lengths here are pretty close to being equal. So if I turn this knob, I turn it enough to lock the gears in. Oh, what's happening here? There we go. So now the this gear is actually engaged in uh, pushing this worm gear back and forth, pushing this carriage back and forth. All right. So as I turn this knob, I can control individual wavelengths of light. I'm moving this mirror by individual wavelengths of light through the magic of gear ratios. And from this, one of the experiments that students in this class typically do first is they use it to measure the physical wavelength of the helium neon laser. Right? I, I have an actual stick here that has uh, markings in centimeters. And if I move this fixed amount, and I count how many bright and dark fringes go by, which I can do electronically, I'll show you that later, and you know, I count several thousand fringes go by, I can measure how far this moves. Right, so let me show you some other things we can do here. So right now the path lengths are pretty equal, and if the mirrors are aligned, it means that the, the bright and dark fringes that are going by are pretty flat but I can purposely adjust them slightly to make them curved. Oops, there I don't want a little bit too much. And it's possible I lost it because I bumped it. I seeing something, there we go. All right, yeah, by careful adjustment here, I can make the fringes pretty big. I can make them take up mostly the whole field of view. And by the way, it's shaped like that teardrop because that's the cross section that these tilted mirrors present. So this tilted half silver mirror, it's a circle, but it's tilted at 45 degrees. And if you take a circle and tilt it at 45 degrees, that's what you get a shape that looks like this. Um, okay, so let me adjust the interferometer so that the path length differences are pretty large. So instead of using the, the fine adjust, I'm going to go to the coarse adjust here. And of course, as soon as I click the fine adjust away, I have to reset everything. So kind of a line, pretty big. And I'm going to turn this. So you see many, many, many fringes going by. Might even be too fast to capture in the video. So here I'm turning it quite slow. You can see fringes go by. I turn it more and more and more more and more and more. So I've gone maybe uh, I'll, I'll go half a centimeter before I'll stop. You can see that as I get farther and farther from the place where the path lengths are equal, fringes are no longer stripes. 
they're this bullseye pattern. And when I adjust, I'm adjusting the center of the bullseye pattern. It's actually a little bit easier to work with when, when the uh, path lengths are quite different. And if I keep going, make the path length difference more and more, oops, wrong way. Path length difference more and more and more. So I'll turn quite a bit. As the path lengths get further and further away from equilibrium, the uh, bullseye pattern gets finer and finer and finer. You can see here I'm turning it by hand as slowly as I can turn the big knob. You'll see that as I add individual wavelengths of light, the bullseye pattern seems to emerge from the center and go out. So this is how I would know that I'm going the wrong way. I'm, I'm making uh, the path length longer and longer and longer and longer. Let me see how far we can go while still keeping this aligned. So now I'd say we're almost a whole centimeter off. And a centimeter and a half or so coming up. I can keep going here. And I get interference through quite a range because the wavelength of the helium neon light is uh, extremely stable and extremely narrow. So I don't have to have the path lengths be exactly equal. I can interfere waves thousands and thousands and thousands of wavelengths away. Uh, the distance I can go and still see interference is called the coherence length. The coherence length of a helium neon laser, uh, we can look it up, but it's probably 10 centimeters or a meter. Uh, depends on how thermally stable and how isolated from uh, the environment the laser material itself is, because any small vibrations change the, the wavelength of the laser slightly. All right, so now I'm pretty far out, and my bullseye pattern is pretty, pretty small. All right, so the way I'm going to use this interferometer in this particular experiment, I'm not going to count how many fringes went by in measuring this distance. That would be a way to measure the wavelength of light. Um, and there's an automated motor to do that, by the way, that people don't so turn it by hand. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stick a gas cell in here. I'm going to let in, I'm going to pump out all the air and let it back in, and you'll see some number of fringes go by. And that implies that the optical path length that the light has taken is getting longer and longer and longer as I let the air in. It has to go through some uh, air, which has a different slightly higher index of refraction than vacuum. All right, that requires me to rearrange things. It's toward the edge of the table, still going through the same microscope objective. It goes over to the interferometer, which is now quite mis unbalanced. This, this arm is quite far out. That's OK. That'll just give us circular fringes. What I've inserted here is I've inserted a cell that is attached to a vacuum pump, and I can suck all the air out. And uh, there's a vacuum gauge, and the pump is down here. I'll do that in a second. This is a thermometer here, which uh, monitors the temperature of the air, which is important for comparing the results that you get to theory, because the index of refraction of air slightly depends on temperature. So this electronic thermometer is reading out over there. It says. 21.1 Celsius, and the pressure here is about 725 millimeters of mercury. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the vacuum pump. I'm going to pump air out. So this, let's follow this tube here. This is a cell that has clear, clear glass uh, front and back. Otherwise, the light wouldn't go through. This tube comes up here, and this branch goes off to the, the device that measures the pressure. This branch goes to this valve here, which I can turn to slowly let air back in. Right now I'm going to close the valve by tightening the screw so that no air can come back in. This branch down here goes to this valve. And whenever, whenever we have valves like this, having them crossed like this means the valve is closed. Having them parallel like this to the line means the valve is open. So 
Actually, let me turn on the vacuum pump and we'll watch the pressure go down. So first let me make sure that this top valve is correct. All right, so here we go. I'll turn on the pump. Ooh. Make sure this valve is closed. And you can see it went down pretty quickly. I'll let it go for, for a while. So we're not gonna get quite down to zero, that's okay. First thing I'm gonna do is close, close off this valve and turn off the pump and the pressure doesn't change. This valve is still closed. And what I'm doing is I'm gonna open up this valve and you can watch the pressure and the fringes at the same time. I'll open this valve slowly. Okay, so now the pressure is going up and you can see fringes going by. And if you look at the direction of the fringes, they're going out away from the center, which means that the effective optical path length of that longer arm is getting even longer. And let me open the valve a little bit faster. Put through more and more air. And the experiment basically involves counting how many fringes go by for uh, b going between various absolute pressures. And let me open the valve even faster. Let air in. There's so little air in here and there's so much metal that the temperature hasn't changed. It's still 21.1 Celsius. And there we are pretty much at atmospheric pressure. All right, so now we're gonna actually do the experiment where I take the air out of the glass vessel, put it back in slowly and watch the fringes go by. And to do that, we're actually gonna use an electronic detector here. It's a photodiode and it has a, uh, pinhole at the front, an iris, sorry, at the front that I can adjust. So let me just turn the interferometer a little bit to show that the, the fringes move. And this iris here, I can adjust it to be bigger or smaller. And that adjusts the total amount of light that comes in. And I would say that's probably a good happy medium. We don't want it to be too big because we don't want it to capture uh, the rings we just wanted to capture the very center of the bullseye. So it seems pretty reasonable. And I, when I block it, you can see that the, the light goes, goes off. Um, also, when I block the laser itself over here, the light goes off. And that's what we're going to use to record every hundred millimeters of mercury as this, uh, as I let the air in. All right, so note, let's note the temperature. It is 21.0 degrees Celsius at the moment. And now I will turn on the vacuum pump. I need to open that up, turn it on, close this valve. Okay. While that's taking all the air out, let me just slightly close this because it looks like we're going above the maximum. All right, so I have to be careful not to touch the table. Okay, that looks pretty good. We're pretty close to zero. Though we're gonna start our first measurement at 100 just to let things stabilize a little bit. So let me close this valve off and the vacuum pump off. Let things stabilize for a little bit and I'm gonna start letting the air in, and every 100 millimeters of mercury, I'm gonna interrupt the laser beam. All right, here I go, letting the air in. All right, and you see a sine wave forming on the oscilloscope. It's pretty good. And 100, interrupt it. And get ready, 200, interrupt it. 
And what you'll do is you'll look at this data, and you'll figure out how many fringes went by, or fractions of a fringe. 300, right there. Might have been a little bit early. And fit that to an appropriate function, 400. And I'm going to go through this whole procedure at least five times and give you the recordings off the oscilloscope, which you can 500 open up in uh, Python and plot and analyze. Now, some of the, the final fitting you'll do automatically, but some of the data extraction in terms of counting fringes you'll do by hand, probably 600. Uh, some people have tried to fit a uh, sine wave whose frequency is slowly changing and take into account the interruptions I'm making, but I'd say that's not worth it. All right, almost 700, and then I'll declare it done. Even though we haven't quite reached atmospheric pressure. 700, there we go. Okay, so that's how I'm gonna take the data. Now I'm gonna save the oscilloscope trace to the USB drive and send it to you. Press to save, press to save, writing, okay, stop. Running the experiment the second time. Note the temperature, 21.0 Celsius. And let me turn the vacuum pump on. Pump out the air from the chamber. A lot of fringes are going by very quickly. I've got the oscilloscope on a much slower setting this time because when I save it, it only saves what's on the screen. Oops, I think I forgot to close this valve. Can do that. All right, that's good. I'll close off the bottom valve, turn off the pump, wash away the smoke, let the oscilloscope stabilize for a second. Now I will let in air, and I will interrupt it at every hundred. Trying not to bump it this time. One hundred. And two hundred. Three hundred. Yeah, the oscilloscope, you can see my interruptions there. Seven hundred. All right. Let me run over there. Save the waveform. I'll let it get to atmospheric pressure here. Temperature is still 21.0 Celsius. All right, press to save, save. All right, let me do that again. 